all the more what had infused him. Because I had lived in England and I had been formed here, I had a different angle of vision about Mike than his immense number of friends in India. In the British left, and no doubt elsewhere as well, there is unfortunately sometimes a kind of left elitism. We admire the writers of remarkable books. We admire even more those who, in addition to their penned contributions, are also active in the sense that they will lend their names to campaigns, join a demo, and often be a star speaker, or generally give talks and speeches on various progressive platforms. And some do this over the years and decades, resisting all the temptations of joining the mainstream as illustrious renegades. They still maintain their revolutionary and radical beliefs and commitments. Mike was all this and something more. He was a gifted writer of many great, indeed, path-breaking books, a powerful columnist, a fine speaker who graced innumerable platforms and causes. But he also spent the greatest part of his adult life working in what can be called the trenches of everyday, routinized, time-consuming, tiring, repetitive, unglamorous, left-wing political activity on the ground. This is a combination that is extremely rare on the left, let alone anywhere else. It shows a level and depth of radical commitment, as well as personal humility and a complete lack of airs that, to me, made Mike very, very special. Mike did have his faults, but they were also Indian. Two faults in particular. Mike loved to talk, right? <laughs> Indians love to talk. Hmm? I have a British friend who says that at every international conference, he has only two problems. How to get the Japanese delegate to start speaking and how to get the Indian delegate to stop speaking. <laughs> in fact, after the new economic policy in 1991 that took place in India, there was an economics conference in Seattle, Washington. And delegates from all over the world went to speak, the Indian delegate, the British, the American delegate, all of them. And they were all given 15 minutes to speak. And so the American delegate, British, they all spoke. The Indian delegate speaking about the new economic policy of India spoke for 45 minutes, uh, one hour, 10 minutes, one hour, 36 minutes he spoke for. Then they boarded the plane to go from Seattle to New York. And the plane got hijacked by some terrorists. And the terrorists said, listen, we are going to give each one of you one wish, and then we're going to shoot you. Right? So the British delegate said, OK, you please give me my roast beef and Yorkshire pudding or whatever. Right? And the Japanese delegate, my uh, sake. The German delegate, please show me that video of uh, Germany winning the World Cup football. Right? <laughs> the Indian delegate got it. He said, I'd like to make one more speech about India's new <laughs> Then the American delegate got up and he said, please give me my wish. Please shoot me before he starts. <laughs> his, second, his second big fault, second big fault was that he liked Indian food. Huh? And this is the only argument I ever won with Mike. I said, Chinese food is better than Indian food. Huh? And of course, he would be having all kinds of arguments and so on. But then I had the winning argument. I said, which country has shown by its historical record to have the worst taste in food? Hmm? It's Britain followed by Finland. Huh? I said, in Britain, which is more popular, Indian food or Chinese food? <laughs> Indian food, Chinese food has to be better. <laughs> huh? <clears throat> anyway, I want to end by the pain, and we've talked about, um, I mean, his, his talk and all. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop now here. Um, the pain that one feels individually at the loss of Mike is lessened by knowing that it's so widely shared. In any case, Mike would have wanted us, as so many others have said, not so much to mourn, but to celebrate his life by continuing to do the things he loved doing, including fighting for a much more humane, democratic and egalitarian socialist order than the mess that we have now. I just want to end by saying that Mike was a comrade, a friend. He was a brother and one of the most important members of our family. And he is going to remain loved and remembered. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Ashin, for a marvellous talk and also an audition for being a stand-up. Uh, uh, incidentally, I, the one thing I disagree with, I think the English are lazy. That's why we invented cricket. Um, now, there's a number of, of Mike's lifelong friends who have got to try and encapsulate their lifelong friendship with Mike in just a few minutes. Uh, and the next person who's going to try and do that, uh, I'd like you to give a huge round of applause for Randy Ostro, please. I feel lucky. I told Mike that was what my mother said the day my father died. I told Mike I thought he should feel lucky, even though he was seriously ill, because Liz shared her life with him. I'm saying it today because I feel lucky to have known Mike and to have been his friend. Nobody talked about life and the world the way Mike did. Whatever experience I shared with Mike, no matter how momentous or insignificant, it was more enriching than it would have been without him. Because his observations, his conversation, the astonishing breadth of knowledge he shared with ease and grace made even the best things better. And he gave us so many reasons to be proud of him. He came to New York to represent the UK anti-war movement on that day that millions marched worldwide against the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And although I couldn't get within miles of the stage in front of the UN, I had my transistor radio turned up loud, and I heard him give the first speech of the day. And everyone around me heard him speak. And I told him, that's my friend Mike. And the books. He didn't like it when I pointed out that in every article I read about the film, Ali, the director Michael Mann, and the screenwriter Stephen Revell always mentioned Redemption Song first when they talked about source material. Mike didn't like it because he didn't get paid by the movie company, big surprise. <laughs> but his work was better than the other books that came out about Ali around the same time, and everybody knew it. And even Michael Mann, a tremendous asshole, <laughs> was gracious enough to say it over and over again on the record. I don't remember meeting Mike or Jeff or Joanne. I was two years old in 1958 when John Marcusy drew my father into a life of political activism. As a small child, I knew John and Janet better than I knew their children, but there was always some sort of news floating around about Michael, as my mother still calls him. In March of 1967, my sixth grade teacher, who had been Mike's teacher two years before, died suddenly. Everyone loved him. Mike and some of the other eighth graders loved him so much they came back to his classroom when they were let out early on Mondays instead of going home because it was fun to be there. My first serious conversation with Mike took place while my mother drove us to Mr. Christie's funeral. I was shattered. Nothing any adult had to say made sense to me, and I was angry and confused. Mike sat in the back seat and talked about our teacher in a way I'd never heard anyone talk about anything before. He spoke with clarity, compassion, intelligence, emotion, even humor. He was 14 years old. I was 11. And from that day to this, 48 years later, I've never met another person whose conversation and later whose writing had such complexity, humanity, and depth of understanding, what Colin Robinson called a sort of magic, and a generosity of spirit that made reading his words and listening to him speak wonderful. But it's those qualities that also make it impossible to imagine what he left unsaid. And that's what makes his loss different and hard. The last time I spoke with Mike, he was in hospice. I have Liz and Jeff to thank for arranging the call. He must have had enough morphine in him to kill a horse. He told me his back hurt him more than anything he'd ever felt before. It struck me again, as it had so often through the years, that no amount of drugs or illness could impair his ability to express himself. 
except for the fact that I took the opportunity to tell him that he was my hero and to ask him to visit me in Niantic in the event that there turned out to be an afterlife, the conversation seemed quite normal to me, which means it was extraordinary. But I needed his assurance that he had come to understand that he was leaving a valuable and lasting legacy, something he had doubted in the past. He said he'd begun to come around to thinking that it was true. And then he started talking about John Ford. When he became too tired to continue, he said he wanted to speak with me again the following week. He died three days later. Weren't we lucky? to have him in our lives? Wasn't he lucky to have Liz in his life? Isn't the world lucky to have his books, his poems, some videos, his commitment to activism as useful tools when we try to understand life? I'm especially lucky. My older son's name is Mike. And every time I think of him, which is all the time, or speak to him, or say his name, I get to remember my friend. Thanks, Rainer. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, not least of which because any day ought to contain one part where you hear an American use the words tremendous asshole about someone, which always <laughs> lightens up any afternoon. Thanks. That was absolutely brilliant. And uh, uh, another lifelong friend that's going to come and talk about their experiences and memories of Mike is Elliot Herwitt. Thanks. Thanks. I'm uh, more generally known to my friends and Mike's family as Sam Hurwitt. Uh, Elliot's my real name. Uh, we, we always called him Michael when, when I was a teenager. I don't know why and where that affectation came from, if that's what it was. But you'll, you'll pardon me if I occasionally slip into that when I speak about Mike. Uh, I remember meeting Mike's parents before I met him. John and Janet did a lot of political work, and they did some work with my mother and father. And I remember them visiting uh, our house uh, and, and what great people they were, uh, even before Mike made an impression on me in school. Uh, we would have met during the school year of 1965 to 66, uh, and Mike was already uh, well known to be brilliant and extremely versatile. Uh, we were in an English class together. I remember one, one time uh, getting a higher grade than Mike did on an English paper and how astonished I was and how puzzled he looked, the, the way he scratched his head uh, as if to say, well, I'm not going to fuck up again like that. You know, Everybody knows I'm smarter, and he, he really was smarter. He, he knew more than anyone. He knew so much about poetry. When we were in high school, he would introduce me to, to all of the, the great then young poets who, who went on to have uh, big reputations, a lot of them like Mark Strand and Galway Cannell and, and John Ashbery, and no one else knew about this stuff. I mean, this was just, I don't know where he got it from. Uh, at times, I can, can retrace uh, the knowledge, his, his uh, love and admiration for the film critic Andrew Saris, who wrote for The Village Voice, which was a very important uh, alternative newspaper in New York at the time, clearly informed his great knowledge of the non-American cinema, the uh, Fellini, Antonioni, Ingmar Bergman uh, type type film directors, but already Mike had that, that lack of snobbery and that love of the Western and the, the other genre pictures. And I can remember sitting in front of the, the little black and white TVs we had in those days with him at night and watching on the sort of off-label, cheap local New York TV stations old Fred Astaire movies and Marx Brothers movies and his connoisseurship for, for all of this uh, and, and how, how extraordinary and brilliant he was. And his, his great wide-ranging intellectual interests, all of the, the, the international political writers he knew, again, the, these were things that no one knew uh, as I was growing up before Mike introduced us to them. Uh, I, I tried to teach him what I could, which consisted mostly of things about music, uh, and uh, 
he, he, he took to what was, was naturally uh, going to be his and never affected a taste uh, for avant-garde or fashionable uh, things that later turned out to be of, of purely mathematical rather than uh, artistic or soul interest. Uh, what I saw over the years with, with, with him was that in a way um, intellectual things that lacked uh, not only political but also um, some kind of uh, human heart or, or grounding in reality and, and in the truly important things in, in life uh, fell away for him and became, uh, became less interesting. Uh, something I think may be a little less known about my